Hello YouTube, Cyber Aquarius bringing you the long overdue part 3 of my series, Nitrates in the Aquarium. I want to apologize for how long it's taken me to get up this part 3, but I shot this video last Monday, a week ago, and I edited it with Windows Live Movie Maker, and when I went to upload it, I was experiencing all sorts of technical difficulties. So here I am again, a week later, attempting, attempting to bring this video to you. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed and hoping this is the final cut. Alright, well in part one, we talked about nitrate poisoning and I showed you how to do a nitrate test. And we talked about a weekly rate of production, showed you how to figure that out, and a baseline. And I'll get more into weekly rate of production and baseline when we actually start looking at nitrate removing media and some methods. In part two, we talked about nitrate shock. And then we started looking at water changes as our first uh, means of reducing nitrate concentrations in the aquarium. A couple notes about uh, water changes. Some of you pointed out that I failed to mention something, so I'm going to mention it at this time. But guys, when you're doing your water changes, you want to make sure that the water that you're adding back to your aquarium is nitrate free or as low in nitrates as possible. If it's not, then you may want to look at investing in an RODI unit, a reverse osmosis deionization unit, or aquarium pharmaceuticals tap water filter. For those of you who don't know what the tap water filter is, I've made a video on it, and I'm going to post the link to that video in the description for this video. So be sure to check it out for a very economical way of removing all sorts of undesirables, including nitrates from your tap water. Alright, another note about water changes that I wanted to mention in the last video, but I failed to. But guys, I notice a lot of people, when they're doing their water changes, they're leaving their filters on. And that's fine as long as you're leaving them on only when you're removing the water from your aquarium. When it's time to add water back to your aquarium, if you're using uh, tap water straight from the tap, that hasn't been pre-dechlorinated. So if you're using a, a python or a garden hose and you're simply adding it back to the aquarium, straight to the aquarium, unplug your filters. <clears throat> I know that a lot of people are adding the dechlorinator to the aquarium and adding the tap water straight to the aquarium. Well, it takes a couple minutes for these chlorine, uh, for, the, for the chlorine to be removed from the tap water doesn't happen instantaneously in all parts of the aquarium. So what I'm saying is you're risking the chance of some chlorinated water being pulled into your filter and as this uh, chlor chlorinated water passes over your biological media, any chlorine residual is going to kill your beneficial bacteria on contact. It may not kill all the bacteria within your filter because of the footprint of your filter, but don't risk a chance of killing off any of your beneficial bacteria that's taken so long to grow. So simply unplug your, your filter, add your dechlorinator to your water, add your tap water, wait a few minutes, and then plug them back in. Simple as that. So, okay, uh, well water changes is the actual physical removal of nitrates from the aquarium and the dilution of the concentrations in the aquarium by the, the water that we add back in. And all this is the collective efforts of us as hobbyists. But now we're going to start looking at natural methods of removing nitrates from the aquarium. All living organisms on planet Earth require nitrogen. Nitrogen is 78% of the Earth's atmosphere and unicellular uh, organisms and multicellular organisms require nitrite. Everything from the smallest bacteria up to the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark. Well, we're going to look at, uh, in the aquarium, these unicellular organisms and the multicellular organisms, plants, for removing these nitrogenous compounds. A nitrogenous compound is a compound that contains the element nitrogen. And in the aquarium, we see these nitrogenous compounds in the form of ammonium, NH4, ammonia, 
in H3, nitrite, NO2, and nitrate, NO3. The N in all these uh, formulas is for nitrogen. Uh, our aquarium fish, they also require nitrogen, but they get their nitrogen from protein. Nitrogen is found in amino acids, protein, and DNA. And our fish, uh, if they're carnivores, they get their nitrogen from proteins. And herbivores get their nitrogen from plants. Omnivores get it from both. But aquatic plants, we're going to start talking about these first. They get their nitrogen from these nitrogenous compounds within the aquarium. I know most people looking at this video know about the nitrogen cycle, but not everybody does. I'm going to briefly discuss the nitrogen cycle because it's worth noting uh, our ultimate goal is removing nitrates in the aquarium. The nitrogen cycle basically states that uh, these, these organisms within our aquarium, uh, aquatic fish and our fish and invertebrates, they produce wastes in the form of uh, uh, feces and urea. And these compounds, as well as uneaten fish food and the, the, the cane plant matter, they uh, are in the form of ammonium, the pH is below 7.0, or ammonia, pH is above 7.0. And the first beneficial type of bacteria that start to grow or form in our aquarium and in our filters are nitrosomonas. And these nitrosomonas uh, process this ammonium or ammonia into nitrite. And this nitrite within the aquarium needs to be uh, removed. And the second, the second type of bacteria that develop in our aquarium and within our filters are known as nitrobacter and they process the nitrite, the NO2, and they produce nitrate, NO3. This is where most aquarium uh, filtration uh, units and media stop. They only provide for the, the growth of these nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. These two types of bacteria are known as aerobic bacteria, and aerobic bacteria are bacteria that require oxygen. There is a third type of bacteria known as anaerobic bacteria or anaerobes, and they do not require oxygen. In fact, they'll die in the presence of oxygen. So we're going to look at how to provide for these uh, anaerobic conditions within our aquarium. And now we're going to start talking about aquatic plants, but We'll show you uh, this book here, The Hobbyist Guide to the Natural Aquarium by Dr. Chris Andrews. This was published in 1991. Fantastic book. Discusses uh, a balanced aquarium or a natural aquarium, uh, which is an aquarium that utilizes aquatic plants. And where fish and aquatic plants coexist and complement one another, the aquatic plants will consume the uh, CO2 and the waste of fish and in turn produce oxygen and new tissue for growth. And Takashi Amano also has a series of books, uh, the, Nat the Nature Aquarium World. And adding aquatic plants to your aquarium brings it closer to a more natural environment, but still within Dr. Chris Andrews book and Takashi Amano's uh, Planet Aquariums, there's still one key, uh, key element of a natural aquarium that's missing, and that are these anaerobic conditions, or these anaerobes. I'm not, I don't want to tick people off when I say that they're incomplete. Uh, Takashi Amano is a pioneer in our hobby, probably the greatest planet aquarius to ever come along, uh, as well as Dr. Chris Andrews. <clears throat> All I'm saying is to provide for a complete, uh, as close to nature or natural aquarium as possible, don't you want to try to utilize the other key element of nature, and that's these anaerobes? Well, I don't want to get too far off topic, topic with uh, aquatic plants first. I'll lead into this other part here in just a second, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking about aquatic plants. Um, aquatic plants are beneficial to any aquarium. 
They're beautiful. Nobody can deny that. They provide oxygen for our fish. They uptake nitrogenous compounds and phenols. They uh, provide hiding places for newly hatched fry and even uh, food for some herbivores in our aquarium. Aquatic plants do remove these nitrogenous compounds and a lot of people think that aquatic plants specifically remove nitrates. Well, most aquatic plants will actually use ammonium NH4 or ammonia NH3 or even nitrite NO2 before using, uh, utilizing nitrate NO3. But by removing these nitrogenous compounds before or from the nitrogen cycle before they have a chance to become nitrate, you will be left with lower nitrates in the end. So yes, you will have lower nitrates in the aquarium even though they're removing other nitrogenous compounds. And slower growing plants don't remove these nitrogenous compounds as quickly as faster growing plants. But make sure that you're utilizing some scent stem plants in your setup. And just a note, when I would always set up a plant aquarium, I would plant at a ratio of 60% fast growing stem plants to 40% ornamental plants at first. As your aquarium starts to settle in and these nitrogenous compounds are being mopped up and your aquarium sort of stabilizes, then I would start removing bunches of these uh, stem plants and start replacing them with more, uh, more demanding uh, slower growing plants or ornamental plants. But you always want to try to leave some stem plants in the aquarium if you're relying on aquatic plants to keep your nit uh, nitrates very low. The key thing about uh, these nature aquariums or natural aquariums that's missing, like I said, are these anaerobic conditions. Every aquatic environment on the planet Earth, from creeks, streams, ponds, lakes, even vast oceans and seas, are sitting on the surface of the Earth. They're sitting on a type of substrate such as sand, or a muddy bottom in a lake, uh, a silty bottom, some type of earth material that this water is penetrating deep into. And in these natural environments where this water's penetrating into the earth several meters or feet, these anaerobic conditions are created. And this, this completes uh, the nitrogen cycle. These anaerobes are able to grow in these uh, low oxygen or oxygen, oxygen deficient environments and process nitrate into other gases and, and nitrogen gas which is released back into the atmosphere. But in the aquarium, like I said, these anaerobic conditions typically don't exist so we have to provide for them. And in the planet aspect of the hobby, some people are utilizing deep dirt beds or even a deep sand bed. I know fluorite sand can provide for an anaerobic condition if it's deep enough. But basically, a tighter compacting substrate such as sand or dirt will allow for these anaerobic conditions to exist in the aquarium. A lot of people are using them in their display tanks. Just for example, there's a guy on YouTube, he has a 125 gallon aquarium, which is 21 inches tall, and he has nine inches of substrate, eight inches of dirt with about an inch of gravel capping the dirt. He's left with 12 inches of real estate for his aquatic plants and fish. Guys, I don't know about you all, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna lose nine inches of real estate in my aquarium to substrate. This method does work, it lowers nitrates, but it's risky because within these anaerobic conditions in the substrate, toxic gases can begin to build up and become trapped. And if you have any type of a fish or an invertebrate that disturbs this top layer of substrate, because these anaerobic conditions can occur in as little as two millimeters below the substrate, as long as the substrate's deep enough. If this top layer of substrate is disturbed, these toxic gases can be released into the aquarium's water column.
specifically hydrogen sulfide, and it can kill everything in your aquarium. So to me, the, the uh, risk factors are too great to provide for a deep sand bed or dirt bed within a display tank. If you're using a refugium, which is an external aquarium, basically it's an external aquarium hooked up to your filtration system, which allows uh, the use of either a deep dirt bed, sand bed, or some plants such as fast growing stem plants or in the really fast effect of the hobby, uh, live rock rubble and chato. Um, it's safe to run a deep dirt bed or a deep sand bed because the risk of a fish disturbing this top layer of substrate is far less than when it's in the display tank. So they do work, but just keep that in mind. I'm not bashing on deep dirt beds and deep sand beds. They do work, but there is something else out there that is far less risky. It works and it provides for anaerobic conditions within your aquarium. We're going to get into that in the next video. Actually, I hope it'll be in the next video. I still have a couple more methods to, to talk about before we get into the, the denitrifying media. But I believe I've covered everything in this video. Aquatic plants, very, very good at keeping nitrate levels low. But with any method that we talk about, from aquatic plants to uh, a nitrate removing method or media, we still need to do our water changes, guys, because water changes aren't only about removing the bad stuff, it's about replenishing the good stuff, these uh, trace elements and minerals that are lost through utilization and uh, uh, uptake of aquatic plants and fish. So, all right, just keep that in mind. We're never going to get away from water changes. These methods uh, will help us reduce our water changes and even reduce the percentages of water changes, but we're never going to stop doing water changes. But guys, thanks for watching. I promise I'll get part four out as quick as possible. Thank you for your patience. Give me some comments. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know if there's anything I need to cover you know, more in depth. And guys, thanks for watching. Everybody take care and have a good one.